Hello, and welcome to the joint broadcast of the two podcasts, Cultural Hall. Uh, Richie Stedman is usually your guest there, and also the podcast, The Scriptures Are Real. I'm the host of that, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm joined with uh, Dr. Andrew Skinner as we continue to talk about the Holy Week. And uh, this would be Holy Saturday the uh, that we're commemorating today, the day between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so welcome, Dr. Skinner, and uh, why don't you start us out? Well, thank you so much again. Such a pleasure and privilege to be with you. Thank you. Uh, day seven of Holy Week is called, as you mentioned, Holy Saturday. It's also known in cr Christian tradition as the Great Sabbath. Uh, some even refer to it as Black Saturday uh, or Easter Eve. And this day commemorates Jesus's body laying in the tomb. And for some Christians, the celebration of Jesus's the harrowing of hell, H-A-R-R-O-W-I-N-G, the harrowing or harrowing of hell, by which is meant that Jesus descended into Hades, uh, to hell, or more properly, the place of, of, uh, of the spirits, departed spirits. And uh, these Christians, this sec sector of Christianity, believe that Jesus Christ brought salvation to the souls of those held, held captive, uh, in Hades since the beginning of the world. He's uh, with them and he teaches them uh, salvation, uh, pointing to himself and his great and last sacrifice. In uh, fact, if this... you go to Orthodox Christian churches, this will be one of the more common pieces of art you'll see. Christ in the afterworld, opening coffins, breaking chains, this kind of a thing as he, as he brings freedom to those who are in hell. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, graphic visual aids are always helpful to me. Um, this theological concept of the harrowing of hell is mentioned in the Apostles' Creed and also in the Athanasian Creed, a third and fourth century um, documents, which essentially lay down uh, Christian doctrine and the doctrine of the Godhead. Uh, however, there are a number of Christians who reject the idea of the harrowing of hell uh, they say such things as uh, there is no basis scripturally for this, which I would disagree with. Uh, they say that uh, Hades or hell is a metaphor simply for the grave. Uh, Martin Luther, the great uh, Protestant reformer, said uh, this: that the harrowing of hell is, is not a true doctrine uh, and uh, that it's not uh, the same condition that Jesus suffered, as did those who have passed on before. And uh, rather, they believe that uh, Jesus's spirit was conscious and uh, and resting peacefully in heaven before he re-entered the tomb to take up his body again. Latter-day Saints, again, are so blessed to have uh, modern revelation, section 138, of the Doctrine and Covenants, which uh, talks uh, specifically about Jesus's, that part of Jesus's eternal ministry to the spirits in prison. And we know that uh, Jesus did not, in fact, go to all of the spirits in the world of departed spirits, but went only those to the, to uh, those who are righteous and there he organized his missionary forces to go to those that are in prison, to those that had not yet made uh, covenants of salvation. In uh, fact, that's that's part of the reading when I kind of give myself my own things I'll read each day on Holy uh, Holy Week or Passion Week. Uh, that's section 137 and 138 uh, and some other stuff we'll talk about in a second. But th that's the core of my reading for this day is to celebrate what Christ is doing there in the spirit world. And it's really quite an amazing revelation uh, that talks not only about uh, what happened in the spirit world, but uh, which figures we would recognize who are there where Jesus uh, is uh, greeted with great celebration. And, uh, and it, and it uh, there are certain parts of that revelation which talk about uh, the premortal existence and how uh, the valiant souls that we uh, have uh, appreciated in mortality were given their first lessons 
regarding the plan of salvation in the, the pre-mortal uh, spirit world. So this is an amazing uh, revelation. And, I, and again, uh, from a more modern modern day prophet, uh, President Joseph of F. Smith, and uh, and brought about uh, in an interesting way a uh, combination of events uh, him losing uh, so many loved ones president joseph f smith as well as uh, the horrible uh, deaths and the numbers uh, that uh, that took their toll that n- numbers who died uh, that uh, died as a result of world war 1 so it came about as a result of of different factors but uh, this great prophet uh, was prepared and uh, received this uh, this sensational, and I do mean that uh, in, a, in a very positive way, this uh, revelation. I don't think that uh, as as other denominations uh, would teach that that the events of Friday afternoon at three p.m. must have been dark times, especially Saturday. Uh, uh, been a dark time for the disciples, the women and men who had been with the Savior for the for the following three years. Uh, one of the reasons that John makes clear is that um, they did not uh, yet know uh, about the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And that's John chapter twenty, verse nine. Um, so they 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 didn't know, and and this adds to our um, our feeling of empathy for them, uh, particularly women, whom Luke's describes in John chapter in Luke chapter eight as traveling with Jesus and the twelve from village to village as the gospel was preached and supporting the kingdom out of their own substance. I mean, these are real heroes of the kingdom of the early church. And there one can only imagine the emotional suffering which affected them physically because they didn't, it hadn't yet dawned on them. I think they, it's not that they hadn't heard Jesus preach this. It's just that it wasn't part of their consciousness. Yeah. They didn't understand yet. And so, uh, they're they're suffering um, greatly. In fact, uh, I think that's one of the more interesting contrasts is that at the moment when those who have been in darkness for so long are experiencing a great light in in the spirit world, yeah. those who had been experiencing that great light for those years they'd been with the Savior were experiencing their darkest day. Right. This this was the darkest, most sorrow filled, hardest day uh, of their lives. I would guess. And uh, and that's a strong contrast. Although uh, I always remember uh, a great talk by oh I, th- I think it was Elder Hales the uh, uh, hold on for Sunday talk when you're in these dark oh, yeah, hours. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know the Sunday will come, but they don't yet know Sunday will come. They're in the middle of this terrible despair, having put all their hopes on a Messiah that seems to not have worked the way they thought it was going to work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, speaking of, of the disciples who were devastated, I think is the right word uh, as, a, uh, as a result of the crucifixion. Uh, there are some that, that show their colors as true heroes. Uh, one of those for me is Joseph of Arimathea, yeah. uh, who is a model disciple. Uh, he's named in all four Gospels as one who courageously went to Pilate to acquire the body of Jesus, uh, not knowing if his own life was being placed in peril by doing that. Uh, he was a respected member of the Sanhedrin, uh, but did not participate in the activities of the Sanhedrin that brought about the death of of Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, the the New Testament describes him as one who formerly had feared the Jews, uh, but now on the death of Jesus becomes very bold. Uh, He's described in Mark 15 as an honorable counselor who waited for the kingdom of God. And then, of course, being a rich man, as Matthew tells us, 
he made the burial arrangements for uh, for the body of Jesus. And one thinks about the blessing that he was to the family and, and close associates of Jesus. That's a those who have experienced death know that one of the hard things to do is to sit down and make arrangements for the funeral. And uh, we've all had bishops or church leaders who have stepped in and helped in that role, which is such a profound uh, blessing to us. And this is the role then of both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the same one who came to Jesus by night and received a lesson on <laughs> the nature of, uh, of baptism and entering the kingdom of God. And I think it's it's uh, important to realize that uh, Nicodemus, uh, who was also involved in the preparations of Jesus's uh, burial, uh, brought not just um, a huge amount of embalming spices to prepare the corpse of Jesus, but he brought a regal or royal amount of spices and materials representative of what was used in Israelite royal burials, as indicated in passages like Second Chronicles chapter 16. They were the ones that gave Jesus the, the kingly burial that he so, so rightfully deserved. And, uh, and interestingly enough, Josephus also mentioned huge quantities of spices in connection with the burial of King Herod the Great, who was uh, sort of the, I don't know, the really bad, bad man <laughs> of Roman <laughs> Palestine. Uh, so Jesus then is, is buried uh, by uh, disciples who we owe an eternal debt of gratitude uh, by. Um, the, the Synoptic Gospels do not uh, say anything about Jesus's ministry to the spirit world. Uh, well, None of the four Gospels mention anything about Jesus' ministry of the spirit world, but Peter does. Yeah. First uh, Peter chapter 3, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Uh, one of the proof texts, uh, I think, that prompted the revelation given to Joseph F. Smith. Um and, uh, and one just comment uh, about uh, something that President Brigham Young said uh, that is a unique contribution, I think, to our understanding of Jesus's eternal ministry. Quote, Jesus was the first man that ever went to preach to the spirits in prison, holding the keys of the gospel of salvation to them. Those keys were delivered to him in the day and hour that he went into the spirit world. And with them, he opened the door of salvation to the spirits in prison. And so Jesus is the being in the universe who holds the keys of unlimited power over sin, death, hell, sorrow, suffering, the bottomless pit. All of those phrases that are used uh, in passages of scripture. Um, one, of, one of the reasons I bring this up is because in a moment, not in a moment, uh, our next episode, I think we'll discover that uh, that there are keys that are associated not only with death, but keys that are associated with resurrection as well. Mm -hmm. So all of this then is mediated by the holy priesthood, uh, the, the priesthood of the Son of God, the Melchizedek priesthood. And uh, we need to have priesthood keys to function and to operate in the way that our Father in Heaven intended, and, and that's true for Jesus's uh, visitation to the spirit world. Um, I am grateful for the knowledge that I have of Jesus's ministry to the spirit world, and uh, like you say, uh, I I try to read section one thirty eight of the Doctrine and Covenants not just because it teaches me about Jesus's ministry to the spirit world but because there are so many other aspects of the gospel uh, yeah. that it teaches me about. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm thankful for our friends of other denominations who, who do celebrate or commemorate is the right word. Jesus's um, 
visit to the spirit world. Wonderful. And, and, you know, I think, um, I think we have another scriptural account actually of, uh, what the savior is saying or doing during this day on the tomb. And that's in the book of Mormon. Uh, so we have in, in third Nephi eight, the terrible destruction that happens, uh, when the savior dies. And, uh, and so I would assume what happens after that is after his death. And that's when we get in third Nephi nine, they hear the voice of the Savior telling, talking about that destruction. But to me, it's worth um, reading just a, a couple of uh, passages from there. Uh, after he says in verse 13, uh, ye that are spared because you were more righteous. Uh, but look at verse 14. Yea, verily I say unto you, if ye will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Now, I suspect that he's saying this to the Nephites, and at the same time, in one way or another, he's saying it to people in the spirit prison. Uh, you know, but if ye shall come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive. And blessed are those who come unto me. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. I was with the Father from the beginning, and am in the Father, and the Father in me. And in me hath the Father glorified his name, that same unity that we keep talking about. And then he says, I came into my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning me at my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received me, to them have I given to become the sons of God, and, or, or we could say children of God. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh, and in me is the law of Moses fulfilled. I am the light and life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And so I, my understanding is that that would have been at the same time period uh, after his death, and uh, that this is the Savior, even while dead, proclaiming the gospel, uh, giving, making sure people understand that he's done the Father's will and that that gives him the ability to offer us redemption and eternal life. Uh, and he's teaching it to Nephites. He's probably teaching it to other people elsewhere on the world who are scattered Israel or something along those lines. He's certainly teaching it in the spirit world. And through those scriptural accounts, he's teaching it to me and to you. And it was possible at that moment because he had died. Yeah. And and I think that that's, uh, that certainly is a possibility. Some want to place, um, uh his appearance to uh, the Nephites later. Well, this uh, isn't his appearance yet. So but, I, I think his appearance is about a year later, but this is the voice uh, at the uh, time. Yeah, of but the, the, the question is when, when, when was he resurrected? When was this statement made? Was it while he was in the spirit world or was it, uh, you know, after he was resurrected? So I think that that's uh, an excellent uh, um, passage of scripture to read during Holy yeah. Saturday. Uh, which is uh, what we're all about. Yeah. Well, thank you. This uh, It's a, a wonderful, uh, it's a solemn day to consider, and in some ways a sad day, but in some days, in some ways, a, a fantastic day because of that light that is being extended uh, all, uh, all over creation. So thank you, Dr. Skinner. And uh, we have thank one... You. One day less uh, left to, to consider in our celebration of the Passion Week, and that is Easter Sunday. So join us for that uh, tomorrow.